Welcome to the Jay Kim Show, Hong Kong's very first podcast focused on entrepreneurship and investing in Asia. Join us as we survey the land and discover the greatest companies and most profitable investment opportunities in Asia. If this is your first time listening, thank you for stopping by. This podcast is produced every week with the goal of providing actionable insights to you, the listener, with every single episode. And now, on to the show. Today's guest is Bay McLaughlin, co-founder of Brink, which is a global Internet of Things IoT accelerator based in Hong Kong with offices in Shenzhen, Guangzhou, and London. Bay is originally from the States, Virginia Beach, but he sort of uh, muscled his way into Silicon Valley and he worked for Apple for a long time, but then he realized that there was a massive market opportunity and potential in China, uh, particularly in the hardware space. So he decided that the opportunity was too great to miss out, to quit his job at Apple, one of the best jobs in the world at the time, and he moved halfway around the world to Hong Kong to start this accelerator called Brink. Bay is very passionate about supporting the startup ecosystem here in Hong Kong, and he speaks regularly at all the large tech conferences around the world, such as South by Southwest, Web Summit, Echelon, and of course, Rise. So let's get on to the show. All right, Bay, welcome to the show. Two times in two weeks. I'm so lucky. I'm the lucky guy. Um, uh, thanks for uh, thanks for coming on again. <laughs> well, we we're doing the summit time. earlier, so this is uh, this one is uh, for the the podcast. So, but I'm happy to have you on. Maybe you could uh, give our audience a little introduction. Who's Bay McLaughlin? What do you do for a living? Thanks so much for having me, and uh, absolutely happy to talk whenever you want to. You know, whatever we can do to help connect with people share what we've learned, uh, happy to do so. So uh, myself, Ben McLaughlin, a lot of people call me Bay in the Bay. Uh, a, couple, a couple of bits of background there, it sounds a little kitschy. It's, uh, it's mainly because I really do think that uh, you should be experimenting and trying things at all times, recognizing that you are where you are, you are who you are. Uh, there's nothing you can really change about where you are today. You just have to recognize that and that we're all in some, some general state of imperfection and that mm. that's completely normal. Um, and from my company side, I've uh, been in tech uh, for about 12 years, um, started out in Silicon Valley, I uh, was very fortunate, kind of blue collar upbringing in the East Coast, parents in the military and teachers, a real no tech background, no hand up, no uh, kind of access, but drove cross country after I graduated and uh, got myself into tech in Silicon Valley, loved it. Uh, and have found uh, absolute passion in the tech field for a very long time, both building companies, supporting founders, building companies, and now through Brink, uh, both building my business that actually supports founders of startups. So kind of a perfect world for me. Yeah, yeah, nice. Uh, nice, nice. Oh, I uh, forgot the Asia part. <laughs> but, well, yeah, we'll get into that, that's for sure. Um, cool, cool. What, uh, I don't think I ever asked you this before. Where, where are you from originally, though, from the States? Uh, Virginia Beach, so oh, right on okay, the East yeah. Coast. Yeah, kind of. No one, no one really knows, but uh, Virginia Beach, a couple of blocks from my house, is called First Landing. It's where uh, America was found by the British. Right. So, from the root, from the roots. Yeah, yeah, nice. Well, you know, I went to uh, I went to college at, at Carolina in the UNC. Oh, Hill, UNC! So. Oh man, you, my brothers would love you. I love <laughs> Duke. They would, they love UNC. Constant oh. battle. Yeah, so um, yeah, I, I I know Virginia Beach well because uh, I did a couple of the 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 summer or spring break runs up there, you know. Um, yep, got to. So when you went out to uh, Silicon Valley, what was that experience like? I mean, was it did you have a job ahead of time, where you kind of just went out there, networked, and found your found the job at you know, Apple or whatever? Yeah, the, the, yeah, the second the second one. So um, no one in my family was in tech. The the, the break that I got though, which um, I have to say there's certain breaks that you look back on and opportunities that you have and you realize, you know, okay, I either manufactured this, like I had a lot to do with this one, or, you know, I really had very little to do with this. I just got very fortunate. And uh, I was in uh, college um, in Virginia at William & Mary. I studied abroad in Australia for a little bit, and I heard about this program where Apple would actually hire kids that were in college. Oh, wow. And so they called it the Apple Campus Rep Program. You know, it's pretty much like it's kind of like what Red Bull does and all these other groups do. It's like you're on campus, you're promoting, you are given all this swag, you help do like promotion, evangelism, and sales. Um, I, you know, I, I knew that this is something that I'd be passionate about, um, but they didn't have a role in my region. So I had to kind of fight tooth and nail and find a way into the company uh, and really kind of told them either give me a business card or not, I'm going to do the job regardless. <laughs> and I, <laughs> 
was fortunate enough to get enrolled with them in college. The problem that I had was they weren't very good at transitioning their college kind of farm team, if, if you will, of you know, where they're breeding and incubating all of us to the actual uh, mothership and right. Cupertino. They had a really bad transition rate. So unfortunately, I couldn't find my way in. And I had that kind of mentality of, well, you know, if they're not going to let me in, I'm going to show up kind of thing. <laughs> and so yeah, – yeah. Um, so I drove cross country, uh, did not get the job that I wanted to interview uh, with at Apple, was interviewing at Google, Facebook, other places, also small startups. I uh, didn't know anyone. I was sleeping on the couch of a friend of a friend and finally found my way into a small startup that you've never heard of. Uh, you know, I, I'd gone into pretty good debt by this point on credit cards and such because right. I just kind of knew in my head that I had to be there. I just had this feeling that I was going to be in tech, tech the rest of my life and I just had to go to the Mecca, right? Um, yeah, yeah. and it was okay, you know, dug myself out, the company got folded in a year. So that, that's a great experience to have, uh, you know, a big loss on your record from a startup, you know, company that's not your dollar. <laughs> that's actually <laughs> a really good experience to go through early. And, uh, certainly one of the things I look back on, um, in terms of the best things I can recommend people is, uh, you know, you need both corporate and startup experience in my, in my opinion, but I think it's really good to start in a small business right out of school because you're forced to wear so many hats, you're forced and you're given so much responsibility at a young age that at least makes you know what the other side of the equation is because right. obviously in corporates, you have to specialize quite early. As younger people in corporates, you generally don't get much responsibility and I think you don't really understand what you're capable of. So I think uh, you know, I went to startups and I went back to Apple, big company, and back to startups. I think that I would highly recommend that, that kind of um, – transition process is start right. in a small company, cut your teeth and then go to a corporate to kind of, you know, learn some of the bigger skills later. Yeah, that's good. That's a good piece of advice. And, um, you know, I, I like how you, how you, you, you say that, uh, you know, a lot, most people would, would, would think that a company folding was, is not a very positive experience, but the fact that you're able to, to see the bigger picture, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, failure is necessary for any sort of success and you learn a lot of these mistakes early on and like you said it, it, it was luckily on someone else's dime which is mm -hmm. uh yeah it's, it's it's that's a that's a fun funny topic uh, uh within the startup world because uh, some people don't take investor capital as serious as they should but having said all of that um personally for you and your development i think that was uh, that was fortunate so uh so walk us through the next section of your life um if that includes, well, part of Apple and then uh, your transition over to Asia. Sure. Um, so anyone can obviously check the other, the other podcast or the, the other event, but ultimately it was pretty, pretty quickly. I went to another startup, three of us, we sold it. Uh, and then I went back to Apple in 2008. I had my own startup that I was trying to start up. And then I realized, you know, I was 25, didn't know shit about anything. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> So I wasting a lot of my money and realizing 2008, everyone you know that remembers how bad that time was. It wasn't actually bad in Silicon Valley. I always kind of remember giving my mom a little bit of crap, being like, "What are you talking about? This whole recession? We're hiring, you know? Like, what yeah. are you talking about?" Um, it was kind of not. It wasn't really felt in the West Coast, but uh, anyhow. So we uh, went. I went to Apple. I learned a ton. I had a really amazing opportunity. This is like the that opportunity that you realize you didn't really manufacture it. Uh, you know, I just got very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time. Uh, obviously worked my ass off, you know, did my best and was given an opportunity of a lifetime at Apple. Um, we got to build their small to medium business division, which fortunately enough, not only helped me, you know, learn how to lead at a company like Apple, which is a great place to lead, like an amazing culture to learn leadership, but then also the ability to build a division and at the same time have all the VCs and tech companies as your customers. Uh, so a lot of them became friends and mentors and obviously still very close to a lot of them today. So very, very fortunate, uh, quit, uh, started consulting with VCs and startups and got back together with my, uh, college sweetheart, uh, after about eight years of, you know, being broken up and, she had this itch to go to Asia. Um, and I mean, at this point, I was consulting with tech startups and tech startups are everywhere and VCs. So why not try Asia? Um, and voila, got myself here a one-way ticket with my wife three and a half years ago and started building uh, Brink, where we support hardware founders of every shape, size, and color around the world. So I feel like, um, so I feel like when you joined Apple, uh, you said 2008, right? Was it? Yep. Yeah, so that's like that's like peak like I feel like the iPhone the first iPhone came out in like 06 or 07 because I remember in Hong Kong I was in Hong Kong I was working at an investment bank like on oh, a trading wow. desk and 
I remember there, I think it was the second version that people were, you, you could actually hack it so you could use it in Hong Kong. Mm. Uh, and people would bring back like these, oh, look, it's iPhone. And I remember one guy on my desk had it and it was like, oh, it's so cool. And then, uh, but it was like outrageously priced. And then, but I feel like that was like, like peak sort of beginning of the rise of the Phoenix of Apple. So why did you ultimately end up leaving Apple? Yeah, this is this is where a lot of my family and friends were scratching their heads. Um, so <laughs> you're you're completely you're completely right. I mean, my stock was crushing it. Um, everything was going well, right? Like I mean, when I left Apple, I was twenty twenty eight, something like that, and I had the number one you know reporting team globally in my division. I was living in Silicon Valley. It's just like my favorite place in the world. Um, I love my fit, my my team. I love my customers. I was making the most money I've ever made. Um, you know, Apple was on the rise. It was really, really hard on paper to to understand. Um, it was kind of actually. I'm about to publish a, a new blog post about this. It was. It's really weird. Like I, I don't know how to completely uh, describe it, but I, I think that everyone knows a point in their life. Like even if things look perfect, like I always use the example of when you you've heard of rich people that are super sad. Right. And, you know, on paper, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're actually going to be happy, you know, when you get whatever that is for you, you know, dollars, titles, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, I just realized, I was like, man, like the future just is looking like the most boring thing for me. Like, I'm just going to sit in this office, I'm going to climb this corporate ladder, I'm going to make a bunch of money, and it'll be cool, but I already, like, I see it. Like, it's very clear what this life looks like for me. And I, I don't know, at 28, I, I, I use this this line, which I use to kind of give shit to my boss because I want him to quit with me too. But <laughs> I said, uh, I, I thought he was a really great uh, leader, so I wanted him to take off and do something with me. But I said, look, I'm too young to relegate my personal and professional development to climbing a corporate ladder. And it's just something that stuck with, I don't know how that came out of my mouth, but it just made so much sense to me. It's like, I just can't give up the responsibility of me developing my potential to this corporation. Like it just didn't make sense to me. So Apple at that point, um, I imagine it was very sort of, I mean, it's essentially just, a, it's not like, Oh, I'm working at a startup. It, it's like a full blown corporate, like huge company. Right. Uh, one of the biggest, like probably yeah. the most possible in the world. Right. So it's like, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I totally get that because, you know, you might be in Silicon Valley and you might be in tech, but, you know, you're still, that's not really, uh, it's not a startup. <laughs> so it's a completely different life, right? I, I, I think I, I totally get that. Um, so, but, yeah, but you need to do this. Like, this is something that I think, like a lot of my startup friends, like getting onto that point a little bit, if you, I, you know me enough now, like get me on a bandwagon and keep running with it. But it was, it was, <laughs> it's very clear to me that people talk shit about corporations with no justification, like no, no leg to stand on. And I look at what I learned at Apple and I could not have learned the skills I learned at Apple about leadership, organizational agility, the ability to execute at a level of perfection and operational excellence that I've never seen in any company. I've ever experienced it once in my life anywhere else. Right. And to learn that and then bring that back to the startup world where you're building companies and you can't do everything perfect, everything else, but then understand what it looks like, understand what having a team that operates at that level every single day feels like to understand like what it means to really develop your team, like personally and professionally develop a highly operational team. That's a skill that, you know, I think a lot of people don't understand that you can get by working at a good corporate with a good team and good leaders, like skills that you can't really learn in startups. Yeah, that's right. I totally agree. I mean, there's, there's, there's for young kids out there or young, young youngins that are listening in. You know, I mean, I think that there's a lot, a lot, a lot that you can learn. Like Bay said earlier, from working in a large organization, that you'll never get those types of soft skills working just as a startup and another startup and another startup. And you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, people slag, you know, working for a large firm all the time. But at the end of the day, it's what you make of it, right? I mean, you can you can sit there and moan and bitch and just not be a happy employee, or you can sit there and try to extract as much uh, of the skills as possible and, and just better yourself, right, for the next step. So Yeah, and um, I, I, I say this to my team all the time in, in, in Brank. Like, we've been at this three and a half years. We're at, like, 34, 35 people. I... Oh, I, I'm dying to get to the point in our business where I have the time that I used to have and the systems in place that I could spend the time I used to spend with my people. Right. With like, I, I just, I, I was so fortunate and I, I, I don't think I really understood it then. 
I think I kind of thought that was normal. Um, but obviously a lot of things at Apple are not really normal in the real world, but I, I, I really look at my team every day and like, I, I'm very apologetic and I, they know, I think they know me well enough. It's like, it's not that I don't want to spend time. I would love to spend more time with you and really teach you this stuff and work with you and develop you. And, and I will one day figure this out, but it's, it's my constant challenge that I, I want to figure out because I know I'm, I'm personally gifted at that. I've learned from a company that's, you know, top notch in it, but I just, and when you're a startup and you're I mean, we're a startup that builds startups, it's like a factor of two, right? So right. it's like even more challenging to find the time. I think it's, you just have to like, kind of, like you said, hang on and take the blessings that you have in those companies, take it for what it's good for, learn what you can, and then just, you know, dismiss the stuff that's bad and then move on to the next thing and find out, you know, new things that you want to learn. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I mean, you have, you have, you have that sort of, mentoring type like giving personality as well i mean i see you all the time out there just you know adding value giving value giving information away answering questions for free so it's it must be even more difficult for someone uh like yourself um so when you came over to hong kong now what what was the drive behind getting into hardware specifically i mean how did this idea of you know co-founding a hardware accelerator uh, come about uh, it wasn't some brilliant plan. Uh, I think that's also one of those one of those misconceptions is all these ideas. Of, I mean, you've heard this a million times, but you know, for any like you said, the youngins out there, it's it's like, look, there's no like master plan in people's minds. It's a day after day chipping away. Like one of the yeah. one of my best mentors, uh, you know, when you've heard that you've heard the quote before, like you know, the the what's it, the overnight success that took ten years or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I think that for for me, the best analogy that one of my mentors ever gave me was. You look at the other side of the river and you're like, I'm going to get out right at that tree. I'm going to swim across and get out of that tree. And then you jump in the river and phew, you're getting, you get pulled around. And eventually you get to the other side of the river and you're not even close right. to like the tree you were looking at, but you made it. And you're like, cool. Like that's kind of how this whole plan thing of building companies or your vision works. It's similar with your life. It's not just building companies. But I just knew that hardware or connecting the physical world was a massive, massive, massive opportunity. And me in my 20s, I'd seen a lot of my friends or people that are a little bit older than me smash the mobile revolution like hmm. some of the biggest people ever right like garrett the founder of uber friend uh the founders of uh stumble upon garrett obviously jason johnson august yeah. uh, all these people that are really 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 profound entrepreneurs like fuck man i missed that i was like i was too <laughs> like i didn't see that i was too young i don't know right yeah. and i saw this hardware thing coming up and i was like man Actually, I think the epicenter of power when it comes to this whole IoT thing is going to be in China. And having been at Apple, I at least had a massive appreciation from the products that they developed in my life and how you know much emotional kind of uh, I don't know connection you have with these devices. Like you really right. love your Apple, well, at least I love my Apple devices. And I realized, okay, this is going to be huge. And if I can understand what's going on in China, and I know what I know, having been in the Valley for almost ten years. Like this combination will be powerful. And I actually started out trying to raise a fund and, and thank goodness I didn't follow up on that. I, uh, I don't think I'd make a very good banker. But I, I, I ended up realizing that uh, it was really more about just supporting the complexity that it, you know, these founders go through on a daily basis. And if we can just do more either investments or we can do more acceleration and programs and handholding our studio where we build the products in China or our online community of Enter China where we actually edu educate them remotely even if we've never met them. Like how do we keep just supporting and supporting and supporting this next generation of entrepreneurship which will be connecting the physical world to the internet, unlocking the world's data so we can then improve our lives. And if, if I could be a small part of that, I think it's going to be really, really big and right. – uh, I actually think it's going to make cell phones uh, look incredibly small in comparison. I think it's actually that big. Um, so it wasn't some master plan, but three and a half years later, here we are. So talk us through it. What's what do you guys do at Brink uh, exactly? I mean, the accelerator. You you uh, there's a seed component where you guys fund them as well, and then uh, what else you got going on? Yeah, we look at it more as a life cycle because we started out as an accelerator, but to, to, to go one step before that, a lot of people have questions of what it means to build IoT or hardware or people see a wearable or they see a cool smart connected home device or they see something on Kickstarter or whatever it is. Or they buy the Philips Hue lights or an Apple Watch and they go, huh. And then all of a sudden you start realizing you can pretty much connect everything. Now, why would you connect? That's a different question. But we realized that there's a lot of things that we can help people learn remotely. So we actually acquired a company called Enter China recently. Uh, it's just enterchina.co. 
uh, where it's an online membership and a community where there's already 300 hardware founders that are learning together every day of how to validate their ideas, how to recognize what's a good idea, how to launch a campaign online, pre-orders or crowdfunding, how to actually manufacture, all the things that you need to know to get started. Um, and if some teams will join our accelerator, they will. And then other teams around the world, they're thinking about more of the investment mentality. They want to build an exitable business. So they'll join our accelerators, which we have our global online uh, remote IoT accelerator. You can stay where you are, validate, don't spend money traveling, don't quit your life because our cohorts are open right now. Like, live your life, build your company, stay where you are. Uh, and then our drone accelerator is one of our verticals because we're really excited about what building the Z axis is going to do for the world, the ability to go underwater and in the air and really do things that humans have never been able to do that can really help improve the world. And then uh, we have a new accelerator we just launched a couple weeks ago, which is for later stage companies, which is when they want to actually enter the Chinese market. So if you have great products, we have a new uh, program called uh, the Guanxi program that will actually help you get set up, localize, and distribute your products into mainland China. So that's all the accelerator side. Um, and then when you actually have to make the product, we have our studio. Um, and that's where we just make sure that you can make the products the right way the first time using all the amazingness that is China to your advantage because uh, mm -hmm. we've actually been in China manufacturing for a combined 101 years right now and quickly growing. Uh, and we've actually mm – -hmm. I just counted yesterday. I don't know why someone's asking me. I happened to look in our systems. We've actually now helped ship. 32 different startup products like from scratch and that's crazy you know like these ideas people just sit in these corners of the world they have these ideas and these beautiful things can now come to the world and if it's connected great our studio will have happy to connect you if you're making flip-flops or plastic toys all the way up to nanotechnologies we have some nanotech that we work on but we just keep asking ourselves every day like it's very simple what problems do people that want to build physical innovation have and if we can solve them in any capacity We'd like to do that. And so we've been at three and a half years uh, now, and we've got three accelerators. We've got uh, our studio to help make the products, and we've got our online community, and for China to help you join a community of great founders that are learning together every day. Yeah, so it's like an all-encompassing, I guess you, you called it a life cycle sort of thing where you, you, you like start to finish, so, this, so yeah. to speak. Um, and, and, uh, you know, I, for, for the audience listening in, uh, Bay was on our, uh, China, uh, sorry, uh, how to invest in Asia summit, uh, recently. So go check out that interview, which is, uh, which is a video one, but, um, we, we spent a little bit of time talking about, uh, your China trips. Maybe you could just re, uh, recap that for our podcast audience here. Sure. That was, <laughs> that's actually one of those things is I travel, I travel quite a lot. So please, if you want to check me out, just at Beta Bay on Twitter, or you can check out Beta Bay me and, and my slash events. You'll see, I, I put all my events up. So happy to meet you in person if we come across each other. But um, I just kept realizing that people, uh, I mean, a, a lot of people are discounting just how important China is. And I know that because I did it. <laughs> I was right. Silicon Valley epicenter of the world. And, uh, you know, just I just general American mentality is, you know, you, you kind of discount China. You don't know much about it. You generally think it's kind of like this negative thing even, which is crazy. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and it was just this weird moment of realization. It's like, how in the hell do I keep going city to city to city across Europe, the Middle East, Asia, America? And I can't find people when I ask them who here has been to China and I ask a raise of hands and I can't find people when I'm going to hardware and IoT meetups and all these conferences. Like, this is crazy. I was like, so I finally just like made a call one day going, okay, fuck it. What if, if you show up, I'll pay for the rest. What about that? And I was like, there's gotta be some level of get off your ass that I can incentivize people <laughs> to like get on the damn plane and just see what the hell's going on out here. And, and so after we did the first time, you know, it was this whole litmus test of, okay, you show up in my, at our front door in Brink, we'll get, we'll cover the rest, but you got to pay for a ticket and get on the damn plane. Yeah. And Sure enough, that filled up pretty quickly, so that was a good sign. <laughs> and uh, we've now run ten of those. Not the deal anymore. Just so you know, now you got to pay. But it was it was more <laughs> of a, like a litmus test of like, am I taking crazy pills right now? Like, what is going on? Yeah. And uh, so now we've done ten of those, and we do these week long tours of South China, the manufacturing facilities, the culture of doing business in China, any of the trade shows that are happening. Uh, we do a lot of good hands-on mentoring uh, during that to make sure people get the most out of it. And it's a completely tailored and, and like hands-on package that people get to try to understand China for their first time. So we just want people to, to realize that there's a lot going on out here with the Greater Bay Initiatives, the Belt and Road, or the One Belt, One Road Initiative, connecting all of Africa, Europe, uh, and the Middle East to uh, Asia. 
like a lot's going down here and you need to be paying attention. Yeah, this is so much, you know, anyone that I, I tell this to sort of investors all the time that are always curious about, oh, what's going on the ground there? You know, what's what's the scene like over in China? It's like, like you said, get on a damn plane and come over and see it for yourself. Like you cannot make an educated investment into anything unless you come over and see the magnitude of the basically of the trend that is happening right now, which is which is uh, pretty incredible. Um, so speaking of trends. Uh, as as an on the ground hardware guy, uh, with your ear to the ground, what what sort of trends excite you right now uh, in hardware at the moment? So I think it's probably pretty evident through our investments that you can kind of tell. So um, I think three areas are, are really personally getting getting me excited. The first is around health technologies. I'm still super into health tech. Like I think we've got over half of our investments there. Um, we actually just made a few more. We kicked off our, our next round of our accelerator uh, this morning. I, I really, really think that it, you have to take care of yourself. You have to invest in, in understanding the data that your body's telling you uh, that our family's generation, our parents' generations, our grandparents' generation never had the ability to because the doctors and whole ecosystem were not really set up for it. Like we're the first generation that can take like a clinical grade blood pressure reading every morning in your house or blood analysis or whatever you want to do, depending on what, what ails you. And so for me, health tech is a massive, massive trend in that we're going to see more and more medical grade, clinical grade testing in your home that you won't have to go to labs. You won't have to go see the doctor. So I'm really excited about that. I'm, I actually run the quantified self chapter uh, here in Hong Kong. And oh, then, right. yeah. and then the, the other two, um, well, so let's say you live a really long time now. That's great. Well, now, now you better hope the world's in a good place. So, um, the, the, <laughs> The next one that we've recently started investing in is agriculture technology or ag tech where yeah. we actually have to make sure that there's enough food in the world. The water supply is going to be taken care of, you know, da 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 So we're looking really into uh, how do we protect the world's resources, how do we create more food, how do we support the world uh, that we want to live longer in. Um, and then the third one is around drones, which I have to say, uh, although we did <laughs> – I love Heriberto, our head of our uh, drone program. We hired a rocket scientist for this program, right? And the guy, <laughs> the guy's an actual rocket scientist, not like someone who's just smart, right? He's a literal yeah. rocket scientist. And and I always tell him because he's the nicest guy ever. I'm like, I have to tell you, Heriberto, like I really wanted to hate this program. <laughs> like I really didn't think the idea of a drone program made any sense. But the second we started looking at the applications. Like my mind explodes. It's almost like a mind expanding experiment, like taking drugs or something. Like you, yeah. you see this feed of ideas, and you start realizing that you're the actual dummy, right? Like you're sitting right. there, like, oh man, I'm a curmudgeon. Like I really thought in yeah. two dimensions, like X, Y axis, my whole life. And all of a sudden, you see these 800. Is our first application batch, 800 people, and we're looking at all these ideas, and like, man, I like light bulbs going off is an understatement. Like my head exploded. I couldn't believe how important drones are going to be to the future of humanity. Like it was so profoundly eye opening for me. So I'm so glad my, my co-founder Mata and Heriberto kind of, you know, led this charge. Cause I think a lot of us really, at least I didn't understand how profoundly important drones are going to be for the future. Yeah. It's, um, you, you mentioned something earlier, like the, uh, like under, un, underwater, mm -hmm. uh, th that's also drone technology as well, right? Just made an investment there. Yep. We just did yeah. one. Um, yeah. So most people don't even acknowledge that. I mean, you think about the things flying around in the sky, but also underwater is also very powerful. And, drone. and, and underground, you know, right. we, we right. just made an investment in underwater drone technology that does lots of the maintenance and, and checking on the pipelines, the internet pipelines, the sewage contamination, uh, reefs, like anything that's underwater that you want to continually maintain and make sure things are okay. Or like, you know, even just populations of fish, et cetera. Um, but I saw a really cool, crazy company out of uh, Stockholm in Sweden where uh, they make this uh, custom uh, UAV where you are, uh, uh, you know, uh, was it um, unmanned autonomous vehicle or whatever? So you actually have wheels yeah. on it, goes into the mines, and then when it needs to fly, just kind of hovers over the rocks and then lands back on its wheels and it keeps going. But the problem is that sounds cool, <laughs> also cool. But then how do you know where you're going? Because GPS doesn't work on the ground. So they had to create an entirely new operating system, like a whole new version of GPS to work where GPS can't actually get signal. We actually right. use it. And like, this, this is where we start going like, damn, man, there's some smart people in the world, right? <laughs> and yeah, like, exactly. It's, but you have to kind of just give yourself that ability to, uh, 
dream a little bit and kind of think think a little bit like as a kid again, a little bit more creatively. Yeah, I love that. Um, so quickly on for aspiring uh, startup founders or entrepreneurs that want to apply for uh, a spot in your next uh, class at Brink. Uh, what's the? How does that work? What, what's the? Um, you know, what's the timeline and the protocol to? get an application in and what's the sort of uh, like the uh, support that you, that, uh, that you get if you get uh, accepted into the class? Cool. So we, we have moved from rolling to a little bit more of a cohort basis, but I'll always, always say that we will take a team. If it's a great team and a great idea, we'll never make you wait on our schedule. Uh, we'll always go out of our way to, to get you into our, our company and our programs and, and take care of you. So if you're interested, always feel free to go just brink.io slash apply or always hit me up just at Beta Bay on Twitter. I've actually yep. taken a lot of teams just off of Twitter or Instagram, my LinkedIn account. So feel free to hit me up. But in terms of what you get, uh, we have a four month tailored accelerator program for our IoT accelerator where we actually create a custom curriculum for you because we've been mapping the process for the last three and a half years. So we've learned a lot of mistakes. So we don't put you in this one size fits all batch where you go have a mentor come in and talk about the same thing to the same group of people the whole time. You don't pitch a demo days. You don't do all the stuff that a normal accelerator does. It's tailored to the problems that you have. You can get four months of our time. And we'll go all out to help you get as far as you can in four months, at which point we'll put you into uh, the kind of uh, more passive programs that are still ongoing, but we do founder hours every single month. And we also do 360 audits of your business every single quarter with the most senior people in our company to ensure that as long as you're our family and we're equity holders in your business, we'll try to take care of you as long as we can. Right. So it's a, it's, it's kind of our hybrid version of everything that we learned from all the accelerators that we either worked at before programs we partnered with VCs that we were friends with. We looked at all the systems and this is our best version, which we're so happy with our founders are so happy with. So we'd love to see any applications of uh, any of the good ideas out there. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Uh, cool. Uh, Bay, dude, thanks for your time, man. It's been uh, good catching up and hearing about all the uh, crazy, crazy awesome stuff that you guys are working on over there. What's the best place people can find you, follow you, connect with you, learn a little bit more about Brink and, and uh, catch some of your Facebook Live or Periscope videos? <laughs> yeah, Twitter Twitter's probably the most active, just at beta, B-E-T-A, Bay, B-A-Y, and uh, also obviously facebook.com slash beta bay as well. Um, I try my very best. I literally mean this. I actually would love, I can't wait to the point at which I have, uh, I mean, I do have a lot of questions in my feed, but uh, not too many where I can't actually answer. And Ask me a question I will answer. I've had some very weird ones so i always appreciate people challenging me um nice. but uh please reach out if there's anything i know have learned i'm happy to give it back it's the least i can do so appreciate you having me on and hopefully everyone out there knows i'm available i'd love to help out if i can awesome man great having you on and appreciate your time thanks so much jay all right take care bye i hope you enjoyed today's episode all the show notes and links can be found over at jkimshow.com. Come back often and make sure you subscribe, rate, and review. Don't forget to join us next week for another exciting episode of The J. Kim Show. I'd love to hear your comments. You can find me on Twitter at jkimmer, J-A-Y-K-I-M-M-E-R. See you guys next week. This podcast is brought to you by Hack Your Fitness, the high achiever's guide to getting ripped in under three hours a week. If you're anything like me, you're probably working a full-time job or jobs and trying to find time to balance family life, social life, and last but not least, fitness. Look, I get it. I'm a full-time investor and entrepreneur myself and father of two. So how am I able to stay fit year-round without spending hours and hours in the gym killing myself on the cardio machine? After struggling for the last 15 years trying every workout and diet under the sun, I finally designed a system that allows me to achieve and maintain single-digit body fat for life in under 3 hours a week. Cardio not required. Head on over to hackyour.fitness and download my free 13-page guide that teaches you the simple science behind efficient fitness and smart nutrition and gives you everything you need to know to finally take control of your life. That's hackyour.fitness.